What's up, everybody? Welcome into the Next Pats Podcast. I'm Phil Perry. We have a great episode lined up for you guys today. A couple of receivers joining us on Next Pats. First, we're going to hear from Patriots wideout Trey Nixon, second year guy who was the star of OTAs and spring workouts for the Patriots and has had a solid camp. We haven't seen him necessarily make the acrobatic grabs he was making on a relatively consistent basis back in the spring. But he's been productive when given opportunities. We've seen him produce and be efficient in the red zone, even though he's a relatively undersized guy. He's been able to use his body well, use his quickness in the red zone, and help out Mac Jones. And there we've seen him used in the kicking game. And we're also going to hear from him about a little bit of a change off the field in the locker room in particular. We're also going to talk to Andrew Jamil, who spent some time with us after working out for the Patriots recently star of the fan controlled football league he's played in the spring league as well maybe we'll hear his name called in the xfl if it's not heard with an nfl team at some point in the near future but he's from cape cod he went to stonehill starred there covid in some ways derails his chances at really being able to make an impact for any kind of NFL evaluators, but again, recently he gets his chance thanks to a nudge from Richard Sherman, who is invested in the fan control football league, gets a shot with the Patriots. We're going to hear about his workout here in New England. Not often we get to talk to guys about their experience behind the scenes here at Gillette, where I am right now. I'm actually in the press box as we speak, overlooking the field at Gillette Stadium, but we're also going to hear about his road to that workout with the Patriots, what he's doing right now to stay ready. So a great chat there with Andrew Jamil. But first, let's start with Trey Nixon in his second year with the Patriots, someone who clearly has established some chemistry with quarterback Mac Jones, of course, also in his second year, and somebody who I think has a very real shot at making this 53-man roster come September. Here's our chat with Trey Nixon. All right, very excited now to have with us on the next Pats podcast, Trey Nixon. Trey, you are the star of the spring. Now you're into training camp. We're a week in. We see you making plays in camp here. Just how comfortable do you feel now that you're in year two? I would say getting more comfortable. You know, still got a long way to go, but uh, I feel like the transition from year one to year two is way easier just because, you know, you know what's expected of you. You know what we do here as an offense, you know, as a strength staff. So, you know, going to year two is always a little bit smoother, but of course still have a long way to go, man. And of course it's still hard work. Comfortable, always a dangerous word. And I should know that by now, covering the team for as long as I have. I've learned hearing from guys, you have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. That's the only thing you're allowed to be comfortable with here in New England. But it makes sense, right, that you would feel like the transition is a little bit easier going from the offseason into camp here. You guys had a little bit slower day. We're talking to you here on Wednesday. A little slower day. You got the shells on as opposed to the pads. Does that tell you that the intensity is going to be ratcheted up? Again, tomorrow, you guys are going to be back in pads. You're going to see bodies banging around out there. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, the forecast is going to be a little hot out here, so probably bring some Florida heat down here to New England, I mean, up here to New England, and it'll be a good day tomorrow. The Florida heat seems to have been treating you well, though, here in New England. I mentioned the spring. How much confidence did that give you? I know you had a full year in the system, full off season to make sure that you're on top of things in terms of uh, the language and the playbook and some chemistry with your teammates. But that spring, we're seeing you making – acrobatic catches, one-handed catches over the shoulder, down the field, short to intermediate area. What did that do for your confidence, Trey, that period in the spring, those OTAs? You know, that's what uh, OTAs and minicamp is all about, you know, gaining that confidence. And, you know, for me as a player, it was just, you know, learning the offense, trying to find my role in the team, you know, make plays, earn the trust of my coaches and my teammates. So it did help my confidence a lot, but I feel like I'm going to get the most confidence doing it now when we have pads on, you know what I'm saying? Doing it when it's preseason games, joint practices, you know. I show myself that I could do that. It gives me confidence, it gives my coaches and teammates confidence, and then uh, we're all good at that point. And we have seen you making plays with the pads on as well, especially down in the red zone. You guys have been working a lot of red zone stuff here through the my first God. week of camp. How do you use your frame? You know, you're not Devontae Parker, you're not Jonu Smith. How do you, at your size, operate so that you can be most effective when things get tight down in the red zone the way you have here? I would say using your quickness. You know, uh, guys like Devontae Parker, you know, Nelson, bigger guys, they go up and get it. That's their that's their skill set. For a guy like me, I got to start being more quick twitch, you know, you know, 
change the tempo up a little bit, go slow to fast, you know, fast to slow. And I feel like that's kind of, when I watch film on older guys, these older guys like, you know, Welker, Edelman, Amendola, that's where they really, that's where they thrive at, man. You know what I'm saying? You know, just those tempo, their routes, you know, going fast to quick. So that's something I'm trying to implement in my game as well. Those are those quick slot receivers that we have come to know and love here in New England that have been so productive over the years. What does it take to be successful on the inside here in New England? I know you you are a guy who can really do a little bit of everything. We've seen you, like I said, make plays down the field as well. But that slot position has been so strongly associated with the Patriots for so long. What do you think is the most important part of finding success inside here in Foxborough? I would say first and foremost, knowing where to, what to do and, you know, knowing the defensive covers because, you know, being in the slots, you've got to worry about the safety rotation, linebackers, sometimes the corner blitzing. So just knowing what to do, where to line up, what the defense is doing. And I feel like after that, just uh, helping in the run game. You know, you're called upon a lot as a slot receiver to, you know, take on the force, take on the extra safety or cornerback coming in. So you got to be able to, you know, lower your shoulder sometimes and, you know, begin the run game to get the ball. What they always say, no block, no rock. So. No block, no rock. We heard that a lot last year. Jacoby Myers has been touted. As a, as a really good run blocker for you guys. We see him in, inside a lot. I have to ask you, Trey, where are you at height and weight wise right now? Because I'm not sure, I'm not sure, we don't know for a fact, but the team website isn't always the most <laughs> updated when it comes yeah. to that sort of stuff. So where are you as far as that goes right now? So I think right now, I'm, as from my standpoint, 6'1, 188. Okay. That's right now. Okay. I think they're cheating you eight pounds. They are. I think what the last time I think they got you at 180. I 180, think. Yeah, yeah, we'll have to, we'll have to check back. But that, listen, then. <laughs> that's part of it too, right? Absolutely. I'm sure that's part of your off season as well. How focused were you on that aspect of your game, knowing that okay, if this is going to be part of my role here, I've got to be able to mix it up with these safeties. You know, that's huge because football is a contact sport. You're going to take uh, numerous hits. You're going to be blocking big guys. So just having that extra weight on you, extra strength on you, means a uh, you know world of difference. So for me, this off season just kind of not really changing my body but you know increasing my weight increasing the strength I put on just to take those hits you know block a little bit harder you know make those contested catches that's you know utmost important and we talk about chemistry all the time when it comes to the quarterback receiver relationship especially important I would think if you're working on the inside how far along do you feel like you came when it when it comes to the chemistry you developed with Mac Jones? Because we saw you on social media. That's how we find out a lot of this stuff these days, but on social media. You're out in California. You're a Florida guy. I don't know if you traveled out there, but tell, tell me a little bit about the time that you spent with Mac out on the West Coast to develop that interplay between quarterback and receiver. I feel like chemistry is everything when it comes to a quarterback receiver relationship. Uh, just constantly throwing routes, you know, throwing the ball to each other, knowing, you know, on this certain look when I do a head fake this way, I'm going that way, you know, knowing my speed down the field. So, you know, that chemistry was everything. And, you know, like I always tell everybody, if it was Brian Hoyer, if it was Bailey Zappi, it just happened to be Mac. If anything wanted to throw one this offseason, I was going to try and, you know, get my butt out and be there. So just happened to be Mac in, you know, Del Mar, California, beautiful area. And you know, we got a lot of good work in. Did you get a shout from Mac and, and decide to travel from, from home? I don't know if you were home or where you were. You might have been here. 3,000 miles out west to just get a throwing session in? Is that how that works? Yeah, that's usually how it works, absolutely. That's a pretty significant change in plans to whatever you may have had <laughs> yeah. going on on this side of the country, mm -hmm. but you're willing to do that because it just means a little bit extra time. Were you guys able to do other stuff out there in order to develop, whether it's on field, off field, the relationship that you guys have? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're in Del Mar, California, so you got to go see, you know, what it's all about. And I fell in love with just that area because it's a low key town. You know, we had a bunch of cool, nice spots, you know, went to the beach, saw the beach as well. And, uh, you know, Nelson was there as well, and he was kind of showing me, he had a couple people down there that he knew, and he was kind of showing me all about what Del Mar was about. And, you know, I'm an East Coast guy, I'm a Florida boy, but but I fell in love with California for sure. How's the seafood out there? And then what is, uh, what's the quarterback? What's the quarterback's favorite meal if you guys are in Del Mar? My understanding is a pretty good food scene out there. Yeah, it is pretty good. Now, personally, I don't do seafood. You know, I'm from Florida, but I, I do, you know, burgers, steaks, stuff like that. And I feel like Max the same exact way. You know, that's one thing we do have in common. We don't do seafood, man. A couple Florida guys <laughs> sticking with the traditional dishes. Is my it's my understanding that you guys might be locker mates? Are you guys right next to each other in the locker room these days, you and Mac? Yes, sir, we are. We are. How much does that help? Because we we've talked about that over the years with whoever's playing quarterback here. In that that little bit of downtime, you guys obviously have so many meetings where there's so much communication, so much learning going on there. But in the locker room, we know there's some free time there as well. So have you been able to kind of download some things with Mac just in those little moments that you have, maybe whether it's going to meetings, going to practice, 
but to be so close to the guy, how helpful do you think that has been to you? I mean, it's always helpful if I've ever needed, like, you know, a question on a route or, you know, a certain play. But, I mean, being honest with you, in the locker room, man, you're all over the place. You know, me, I always say, you know, good morning to Matt. You know, when I see him in the morning and, you know, if we have a little time to talk between meetings, it's usually not about football. So, uh, you know, the locker room is always a place where you just kind of hang out with the guys and get a little relaxed time before, uh, you know, meetings. But uh, it definitely does help. You know, like I said, if I do need a, you know, Matt, what I got on this or we went over this play, what are you seeing? Of course, that is uh, really good. Were you surprised to see that when you walked into the locker room for the first time, whatever that was, maybe back in the spring, that, oh, I'm going to be next to the quarterback here? I mean, yeah, it was. I mean, I'll be honest with you, the rookies, especially last year, you know, if you really haven't, you know, went on the field and actually done anything, you were kind of in the, towards another section of the locker room. So I was kind of separated for all my other guys, but it was good just to, you know, come back, you know, year two, be with all my guys. You know, the receivers are a lot of other receivers are there too, so it's all good. You kind of get bumped up to Park Avenue from being back, like, in the closet, back where I know, I know the spot you're talking about where the rookies yep. usually are. Yep. So that's got to be a nice feeling to, to kind of be – in the middle of things, mm -hmm. maybe a little bit more. Well, Trey, what, what do you think is the biggest thing for you? You guys have so much competition in that receiver room. It's so deep. But what's the biggest thing for you to focus on for the duration of camp here? Well, one weekend, there's plenty more time to go. What's your focus right now? I feel like, number one, just being consistent. I feel like uh, every day, just showing the coaches what I can do, make plays, make a big play every day. And uh, the biggest thing about camp right now is just earning the trust of the coaches and all my teammates, just showing them you know, that I can do that, they can rely on me. So my biggest focus right now is just day in and day out, stay consistent. Some work in the kicking game too. We saw you at the end talking to our buddy Troy Brown, who used to work with us at NBC Sports Boston. What are you trying to do on fourth down to maybe augment your role and your and your chances of having a real role with this team come the fall. You know, whatever the team needs. You know, I'm uh, trying to make an impact on special teams. And if it's not offense, special teams. If it's not special teams, they want me on defense, I'll go to defense. But, you know, was, that's all, you know, territory right now that I'm improving on. You know, being in the kicking game is something I didn't do at UCF, but uh, just trying to improve every day on it for sure. We're seeing this guy as a punt returner, as a gunner, outside, inside, red zone, middle of the field. Trey Nixon's been doing it all really since back in the spring, but he's carried it into training camp. Trey, we appreciate you spending some time with us on Next Pats here, man. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Great stuff there from Trey Nixon. And how about that? Moving from the back corner of the locker room at Gillette Stadium, and I know exactly the area he's talking about. It feels like uh, the lights aren't quite as bright literally in that part of the Patriots locker room. Now we haven't been in the Patriots locker room in a couple of years now, but I know what he's talking about. And now plopped right next to Mac Jones. These things don't happen by accident, folks. I think the Patriots are really encouraged by what they've seen from Trey Nixon. Does it guarantee him a spot on the roster or in the lineup come September? The fact that he is now residing in the locker room next to the Patriots face of the franchise, at least as far as players are concerned? No. But is it a bad thing? Certainly not. And I've heard Trey Nixon, even in meetings, is plopped very closely to the Patriots quarterback, as he should be, smart on his part, to make that effort to fly from Florida all the way to Del Mar, California, and make sure you're getting reps in with your quarterback before training camp begins smart for him to try to attach himself to Mac Jones's hip, so to speak as often as he can within the walls of one Patriot place, just to try to further along that chemistry with a guy in Mac Jones, who clearly is going to be putting his stamp on this Patriots offense for the foreseeable future. All right, right now let's get to our conversation with Andrew Jamil. Again, this guy started Stonehill COVID happens. We'll hear all about that, how it impacted his road, but then stars at the fan controlled Football League, where if you visit the Fan Control Football League site at fcf.io and you just read up on this league, if you don't know much about it already, you can help create the rules for this league. You can draft players to teams for this league. You can call plays for this league. It is wild. It's entertaining. I might say the same about this interview with Andrew Jamil. Okay, maybe it's not wild, quote unquote. But it was entertaining. It was great to talk with him, hear about his journey, potentially all the way to the NFL from Yarmouth. Here is Andrew Jamil. All right, very excited now to have with us Andrew Jamil, Cape Cod's own, Stonehill's own, Andrew Jamil. Andrew, thanks so much for being with us here on Expats, man. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. 
So your name comes up in the news for those of us that are following the Patriots, media and fans alike. We hear that you have a workout with the Patriots. You have a phenomenal backstory in terms of what led up to this workout with the Patriots. And we want to get all the details on that. But first, I want to ask you, as as a local guy, getting a chance to work out for the local team that you grew up rooting for, uh, what was that experience like? It was an amazing experience, man. Um, You know, it's an opportunity I've dreamed of my whole life. So, you know, being being that kid uh, wearing the Patriots jersey on Sundays, rooting for him to now, you know, walk in the halls with them uh, for that workout and and, you know, being considered by them is uh, it's an amazing experience and an amazing feeling. Something that that not many obviously get to experience. So what was it like in terms of some of the details, whatever you can give us, Andrew, did you have to be here at the crack of dawn? I know things generally start pretty early here at one Patriot place. And who did you interact with while you were here? What kinds of things did they have you do? Yeah, I had to be there uh, bright and early, uh, 6 a.m. Not too far of a drive from my house on the Cape. It's about an hour. My older brother actually uh, drove me. He just, I think he just wanted to be a part of it. I told him he wasn't allowed to get out of the car. Um, I didn't want him to talk to anybody because I'll talk someone's ear off. Uh, he, he's my biggest fan. So it's good that he wanted to drive me. So that was good. Um, yeah, they had some player personnel guys, uh, you know, come meet me out front, take me inside, take care of me. Um, I had to see a few doctors to get cleared for the workout. Um, you know, took me through the locker room, the weight room, things like that. Got to see some of the guys. And then uh, they took us to the practice facility, me and the four others. And we had about an hour workout on the field. What is that car ride like up from home? Cause you get a lot of time in there with your brother who's, you know, right. I'm sure kind of uh, been with you throughout your your career, going back to your ways. I believe I just found an article online. Uh, you started DY in yeah. high school, right? So, I mean, it, I'm sure he's been tracking your every move since then. What is that car ride like for you too? Yeah, of course he has been. Like I said, he's been my biggest fan since college. Um, you know, it was, it was more relaxing than you think just because um, – you know, I, I know I belong at the, at that level. So I wasn't intimidated or I was a little nervous, of course, you know, jittery, but, um, you know, I just think about it like a job interview and it's a job interview for football. And that's what I've done my whole life. And that's where I feel comfortable, you know, on the football field. So I was confident and I have been, you know, training hard, um, ever since I got done with my season, uh, about a month and a half ago. So I came home and, you know, I didn't, I didn't miss a beat, lifting weights, running, staying ready for an opportunity like this. So on the way there, I just, you know, I know physically I'm prepared and uh, I leave the rest in God's hands and I let the chips fall as they may. So I was ready for it. And uh, man, I was excited. And how did they leave it with you, Andrew? Um, stay ready. And we'll leave it at that. You know, I don't want to talk about what they told me behind closed doors, but, you know, I did well in the workout and they told me to stay ready. It's a cool, it must be a cool experience. Again, for, for somebody who has followed this team and this team has obviously had so much success uh, over the course of, of your childhood. Uh, of you know, and, and for, for you to be in a spot now where uh, they bring you in and they know your name and, and um, potentially reaching out to you down the line to right. do some work for them. Very cool experience. Now, yeah. I had to I had to find the right balance of, you know, not being a fan anymore. And now, you know, like I said, I know I belong at that level. My skill set in the work I put in, I know I belong at that level. So, um you know, for, for those couple hours that I was at the facility working out, you know, I, I said to myself, these are, these are my, these are my future teammates. These are my coaches. This is my weight room. This is my practice facility. You know, I kind of had to uh, go through that mentally and, and really embrace it. Do you think the experiences that you've had, and I, I want to get into some detail about those, but everywhere you've been to keep this dream going for yourself, do you think that helps you put some of those emotions aside when you do set foot here in Foxborough finally? Most definitely. Most definitely. You know, I played D2 college football and I had an amazing career. But at the end of the day, you know, I, I stay humble and I stay hungry. So I, I motivate myself and I, I tell myself, you know, I did really well. And there's some great players in D2, but, you know, it's, it's not Division One. So after that, I was able to play in two professional leagues over the last two years. I played in the Fan Control Football League and the Spring League, which is filled with former Division One players, um, division two and three standouts like myself and, you know, tons of guys that have been on NFL rosters, you know, some of them have Super Bowl rings from years ago. So being able to line up against those guys, it doesn't matter the league, being able to line up and play football against these guys that are also NFL uh, caliber talents. That was huge for me uh, mentally and physically, because, you know, I proved not only to myself, but to everyone else watching that 
I know not only belong at the next level, but I can excel at it. Well, and you mentioned you put, you played in the spring league, but you starred in that fan controlled football league that streams on Peacock. So we're fans of the fan controlled football oh, yeah. league here at NBC. But could you just tell for those who may not be aware of it or up on all the details of yeah. it, Andrew, can you just tell us a little bit about the league and how it works? If you don't know about the fan control football league, you should, because if you're a football fan, it is one of the most wild and exciting versions of football that there is. It's indoor seven on seven, uh, three down linemen. So it's like arena football almost um, without special teams. It's a small field. So there's a lot of touchdowns, a lot of big plays. And one of my favorite part about it, uh, about it was the extra points are one-on-ones, wide receiver versus DB. So for a free agent like me that's trying to get some film and get to the next level, it was super beneficial for me. Um, it, it's, it's a star-studded league from the owners to the players. You know, the owners, um, there's tons of names that, you know, everybody knows whether they're athletes, um, you know, social media personalities, actors, and then guys that play in the league. You know, Johnny Manziel, uh, Josh Gordon played my first year, Martavis Bryant, Terrence Williams, a whole list of NFL guys. Um, so that league was an amazing experience, and I got nothing but good things to say about it, honestly. Well, in a couple of those names, you know, uh, Terrell Owens, Richard course, Sherman, course. Uh, you know, those guys are so heavily invested in the league. And it right. sounds like our supporters of yours, too, Andrew. We, we read Mike Reese did a great piece uh, on you and your journey recently for ESPN.com. And it yeah. sounds like Sherman in particular has been a, a big supporter of yours. How, how much do you think he's he's helped you along and maybe even helped you make that connection with the Patriots? Right. Well, you know, Sherman is is a you know potential Hall of Fame cornerback and he knows football and um, he joined this league for the same reason that I did. He believed in the opportunity for, you know, guys like me. Um, and I actually played for his team. I played for the Glacier Boys. He is one of three owners for that team. So he was tuned into all our games. And like I said, he knows football and he saw me out there doing my thing, making plays and. Uh, he just, you know, he, he kept it honest with me from, you know, every time I talked to him, he just said, look, man, I, I think at the very least you deserve a shot because you're, you're a heck of a player. And, you know, I've seen it done at the NFL level. And I think, I think you can do it. So I, then I found out after the workout that uh, the Patriots had reached out to him for kind of, um, you know, just, just to check in on me, is this guy worth bringing in? And I, you know, he, like I said, he, he was honest with them. He just said, um, you know, for two years, this guy did nothing but make plays. So he definitely deserves a shot. So shout out to Richard Sherman for, uh, for having my back there, but you know, it's, it's well earned. No doubt. And, and I think Andrew, people that are listening to this may hear, okay, so he's, he stars at D2 and he's starring for the fan control football league. He's playing in the spring league. He's getting a look from NFL teams. Why is it that he has to take this sort of bumpy ride or this roller coaster ride to, try to achieve his dream of playing in the NFL, but it really goes back a couple of years, right? I mean, it sounds like your post-college playing career was really impacted by COVID and just the number of, of shutdowns across the football world that we saw during that time. Can you just tell us a little bit about your post-college days and how you've kept the flame burning, so to speak? Right. I'm usually not one to make excuses. COVID COVID is a decent excuse though. <laughs> um, so I had a pro day evaluation lined up um, after my senior year. It was going to be at Holy Cross University and it got canceled because of COVID. I was training for it, you know, my whole senior year after the season got canceled. Um, I was watching the XFL my spring semester of, of college. And I thought that was a great opportunity that I'd like to play in. Same with the Canadian football league and due to COVID, you know, the XFL, um, got canceled. The CFL didn't play at all that summer. And I knew that without a pro day evaluation um, and being an undersized division two guy, it was going to be hard for an NFL team to bring me in. You know, I, like I said, I knew I was good enough, but I had to make them believe. And I needed a little more than that college tape, that Stonehill film. So, you know, I didn't know what to do for a few weeks. I was out of opportunities and that's when I had heard about the fan control football league. And I figured at the very least it was worth going to the tryout, learning about the league um, and seeing if they would even offer me a contract. So, you know, I went to that uh, tryout and the rest is history. I, I did well and they offered me a contract. And then obviously that league helped put me on the map. So that definitely kept me going too. You know, um, I went to that league thinking I don't really know what to expect, but I'm looking at 
the roster is on paper and there are some legitimate players in this league, you know, a lot of good players. So I told myself if I can go there and I can do well and I ended up, you know, dominating, um, I knew there was no way I, I could hang them up now. And, uh, you know, especially guys like Terrell Owens and Josh Gordon telling me, you know, hey, man, you you definitely deserve a shot at the next level. I don't think those guys would say that if they didn't mean it. So little things like that just kept me going. And same with the supporters, you know, people I don't know, following me on social media, kids reaching out, you know, hey, man, you're a great receiver. I look up to you. Little things like that. I mean, that's the stuff that keeps me going. Well, getting great recommendations from from players who know what it takes to succeed at the NFL level right. has got to go a long way. But I think it's also yeah. we, we've seen how many stories, right, Andrew? I'm sure you're aware of them, but whether it's guys from, you know, NFL Europe way back in the day or the XFL right. or, you know, all of these leagues that have, you know, sprouted up over the course of many years, the NFL doesn't have a minor league system. They have college ball and that's, you know, outside of these other leagues, that's, that's really it. So if you can shine in one of these leagues, it makes sense for teams to, to give those guys an opportunity. It sounds like the fan controlled football league is, is going to be a spot that they know that they have to keep their eyes on. Yeah, I think it definitely should be. I mean, guys went from that fan controlled league to the USFL guys went from that fan controlled league right to the NFL. So, you know, if you can play football, you can play football and those NFL scouts and coaches, they know that. So if they see you line up, I don't think it matters what league, if you're doing what you should do, I think it's worth a look. Well, and not only did you work out with the Patriots, but it sounds like Patriots, players, individual players, you had a chance to kind of work out separately with yeah. Andrew. Tell us a little bit about that experience because between, uh, you know, JC Jackson, Justin Bethel, Kyle Duggar, mm -hmm. guys that are real regulars here in New England, sounds like you, you got to work out with them a little bit as well. Yeah. Being a local guy makes it easy. You know, I live within an hour from the stadium and um, through, you know, in person, knowing people and social media, just networking. Um, I was able to kind of get a time and place and I know, knowing where these guys like to go and work out. And, and shout out to those guys really for um, wanting to put in work with, you know, it was me, a couple other college kids, even high school kids. Uh, as long as you were going to line up and bring it, um, they were always down to, to train and get work in. So that was great for me. And it's, you know, it's not like that was an official tryout, but I just knew mentally lining up and seeing someone like JC Jackson, who was one of the best corners in the NFL. And, and I was um, able to compete and have success against him. You know, that that did a lot for me mentally, like I said, because it just, you know, keeps proving that I belong. You can't quit. Keep going. I belong. So shout out to those guys. Um, and that was a great experience. Are you willing to tell us where these guys were working out or does that blow up their spot for future workouts? Are you going to have people swarm in these fields to try to get a glimpse of these guys before training camp? Yeah, um, I won't give away specifics, but, you know, local high school spots in Massachusetts within the stadium. You know, you'd be surprised. Mac Jones and those guys, they just show up and. Anywhere where there's a good turf field, they're going to get some work in. That's a, that's, that's a pickup game that I'm sure a lot of people would love to, at some point, be a part of. You, you were able to do it. And Andrew, tell us where you're at now. Now, I know from reading about you and your career, it sounds like, you tell me if I'm wrong, I know you're a receiver, but are you focused specifically on the slot? Are there other things you're trying to do with your game? I don't know, work in some uh, returner work or, or, or something along those lines to make yourself as attractive as possible, a candidate to, to eventually hit the NFL here. What are you working on right now? Yeah, most definitely. Um, playing the slot uh, is great. And that's where, you, where, you know, I feel like I've had a lot of success, but um, any receiver knows, especially at the NFL level, uh, these offenses got to be able to plug you in at both spots, outside, inside. Uh, it doesn't matter. You know, we're, it's all kind of running the same routes. Um, and, you know, I, I did it a lot in college and even in these, two professional leagues, I can play the slot and outside receiver. So that's something I always want to do. Um, I returned punts and kicks in college. And I know that if I were in the NFL, um, special teams is a must, you know, so I can fly around, I can run. I'm not afraid to get scrappy and make some plays. So if they were to put me in on kickoff, punt return, kick return, I'd be willing to do whatever I can do to, like you said, make myself more attractive. Do you have workout drills like these, these combine drills, for instance, Andrew, that we see that you really love that you feel like allow your talents to shine. Like if you were to tell us your short shuttle or your three cone or something like that, is that, you know, would, uh, is that the kind of stuff you would love to do for a workout because it allows your physical skill set to really be put on center stage? Yeah, definitely. And the thing is, is, you know, I don't have a choice in something like that with a workout. Everyone knows you're going to have to run, you know, a 40, a short shuttle and a three cone L drill. So I try to perfect those. 
But if I'm being honest, I think my favorite thing that I like to show off is running full speed routes. You know, that's what I'm, that's what I do in a game. That's what I would be doing for teams playing wide receiver, line up uh, with a quarterback and run full speed, crisp, sharp routes and catch every ball. And I know you're staying ready. If the Patriots do make that call, Andrew, but is there, we talked about some of these other leagues. Is there another league that's coming up soon? You know, whether it's before fan control football, before obviously next spring in the spring league next year, what, what's next for you? What are you hoping to do next as far as your playing career goes? Yeah. So the NFL is always plan a, you know, um, a lot of things can happen between now and next winter and spring when these leagues start to kick up, but I received an invite to the XFL draft pool. So that draft is in November. I think the XFL is, is good because it's 11 on 11 outdoor it's NFL style. Um, and their special teams. So that can showcase a lot of good things for me and get some great film against great competition. So we'll see what happens, but I think the XFL is a good opportunity. So that's sounding like it could be plan B right now, but like I said, anything can happen. We'll see. Well, Andrew Jamil, thank you so much for, for joining us here on next Pat's telling us a little bit about your story. It's a phenomenal story. And I know, uh, we here at Next Pets and those listening right now that are local, especially they hear Stonehill guy, Cape Cod guy. Yeah. Let's see what that guy can do. Let's get him out there on the field. He obviously has a ton of big name supporters, but now you have some uh, even more fan supporters as well. Hopefully, Andrew, good luck with everything. And again, hopefully we'll be hearing your name here soon in Foxborough. Yeah, hopefully, man. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I really do. All right, a lot of fun talking to Andrew Jamil there. Hopefully, again, we'll be seeing his name sometime very soon in the NFL. It will be a great story, especially a great local story if he's able to find his way back to Foxborough, maybe gets a ride from his brother. All right, so we're coming off of a pretty slow-paced practice for the Patriots on Wednesday. They were in shells in shorts after a couple days in pads. The expectation is they'll be back in pads in the heat on Thursday and so probably a little bit more entertaining session for us to watch and uh, the kind of session that we'll be able to glean a lot from. I still thought there were nuggets that we could pull from today's practice. To me, something Mac Jones told us on Tuesday was that the communication needed to be ironed out. And that makes sense, right? A couple days into padded practice, new offensive scheme, new offensive coaching staff, some new offensive players, players playing different positions. It's going to take some time. But the communication, again, I thought on Wednesday was lacking at times. You know, between Jones and Devontae Parker, who I think has been one of the best players in camp thus far for the offense, looked like there was some pre-snap communication during a period with a little bit of music. Parker runs a route that Jones isn't expecting, ends up floating one to the sideline that gets picked off by Terrence Mitchell. I thought the communication on the offensive line wasn't all that good. Saw a couple penalties, saw Justin Haran uh, jump for a false start at one point that would have been called had there been officials there and had they been calling that kind of thing. There was another point where Mac Wilson, again, this is very slow paced stuff. So it's not like the bullets quote unquote are flying, right? It's not like it's so fast paced, your head is spinning and, and you can't react because everything's just going too quickly for you. Mac Wilson is lined up over the A-gap, right between Cole Strange and James Ferentz, who's been getting a lot of top offense types of reps with David Andrews still kind of working his way back from shoulder surgery. Mac Wilson's right there between those two. Ball is snapped, and he just waltzes, practically walks right into the Patriots' backfield, completely untouched ruining the rep for the offense and really not even giving the defense much of a look because how often is that going to happen? Of course, communications break, uh, communication breakdowns happen during the regular season. And so maybe it will, but it was the kind of play that just felt like a waste of time for everybody. And again, I thought an indication of the communication not being where it needs to be. There was another seven on seven rep where Mac Jones held the ball, waited, was expecting one of his receivers to do something. What? I don't know for sure. Ends up checking it down to Ty Montgomery pretty easily and then walks back towards the coaches that were there and kind of has his palms turned to the sky a couple different times as if to say, what's going on here? What was that? So clearly, again, the communication needs fixing. And while it shouldn't be a surprise, as Mac Jones said, told us on Tuesday, we got to pick it up here. So there is a little bit of urgency 
coming from that side. We are hearing a little bit and seeing a little bit at times, a little bit of frustration when it comes to just how herky jerky the offense has looked through seven days of practice. For more of our day-to-day details and our day-to-day takeaways for these practices, hopefully you're listening to the Patriots Talk podcast, myself and Tom Curran. Hopefully you're reading our stock up, stock down pieces and everything that we have coming at you from Foxborough here, video-wise, written on NBCSportsBoston.com and on TV, early edition at 6. We've got BST at 10. So you're going to get a lot of our takeaways there. But I did want to answer a couple of your questions because I know interest is high right now in this team and how things are looking. But we got a little overwhelmed. I'm going to be honest with you. I love the feedback. This is what I'm looking for. I'm dying for this kind of thing. But because we're already far along in terms of the minutes on this particular pod, we are going to do mailbag roulette. Okay, so we're going to just answer a couple of these randomly. I'm going to scroll through my Twitter mentions right now, pick out a couple. We will answer the rest online at NBC Sports Boston later this week. But let's uh, hit the sound, hit the roulette wheel, John, the skull crusher, Henry. And I'm just kidding. I have no idea if we have that sound. I'm going to pick one right now. Okay, first one's from Sam Cruz at Sam Cruz 11. How have Uche slash Perkins looked so far? Haven't heard much on them, but know they need to step up this year opposite Judon. Great question, Sam. Ronnie Perkins has been, I would say, relatively quiet, although I saw him get in for a quote-unquote sack uh, in an 11-on-11 period on Tuesday. And there are times where he flashes a little bit of speed on the edge. There are little things you notice too about Ronnie Perkins that I think the coaching staff will appreciate. And this is something I've heard really going back to when he was drafted last year is that he has a mentality that the old school Patriots, I think it's safe to call them old school in terms of the kinds of things that they are looking for from their players mentally, uh, that the old school Patriots staff respects. Uh, And one of those things that I saw today was just, again, it's a little thing, but the Patriots are working on punt and punt coverages. And Ronnie Perkins is probably on the second or third punt team. He's not been up there with uh, the ones, but he's right behind the line of scrimmage, right behind the spot where he's supposed to be whenever he is on that punt team. And when the ball is snapped, he's getting into his punt protection drop and then working on getting out into space and pursuing the ball. So that's the Ronnie Perkins rundown. We really have not seen a ton from him. Josh Uche, meanwhile, made the stock up portion of the column on Tuesday. Um, He did lose one rep to Trent Brown. No shame in that. Trent Brown has been dominant in the one-on-ones, but he also got by Brown on one. It looks like he almost used sort of a Euro step kind of move to get inside and by the Massive, formerly almost 400-pound man. He looks a little slimmer to me this year, Brown does. Uh, But he was also able to beat up on Isaiah Wynn in one-on-ones. You know, turned the speed that we all know he has into power and ends up putting Isaiah Wynn on his back. Uh, He also ended up in the backfield on a rep that I saw yesterday in 11-on-11s, along with Christian Barmore and Mac Wilson for a would-be sack of Mac Jones. Uh, So... He looks to me like he has plenty of juice, something we've always known about him. He also doesn't necessarily look like a first or second down option. We've seen a lot of Henry Anderson, and I think if Dietrich Wise was ready to practice, we would be seeing a lot of Dietrich Wise early in these 11-on-11 periods opposite Matt Judon. So you still have your, your one outside linebacker on one side, but then on the other, it's been a guy who looks more like a 4-3 end, again, it's been Henry Anderson for the most part, um, showing up early on some of these early down moments in practice. Uche on third down, move him around, send him off the edge. We've seen linebackers rush from up the gut, whether it's Mac Wilson or Anthony Jennings, who has had a good camp thus far, or Uche himself. I think they're going to be able to play with him a little bit in terms of how they send him off uh, after the passer. Uh, But that, to me, looks like his role right now. I will say, too, we saw a little bit of Josh Uche off the ball 
playing more of a traditional inside linebacker role in the spring. We haven't seen that in training camp to this point. All right, Mailbag Roulette takes us to David Creed, our guy from the Nantucket Current. David asks, do Kyle Duggar and Christian Barmore overtake Matthew Judon as the Patriots' best defensive players this year? A lot will be asked of both. I agree, David. A lot will be asked of both. I think I agree partly with your assessment in that Christian Barmore, to me, will overtake Matthew Judon as the recognized top player on the Patriots defense. I think there were moments last year where he was better than Matthew Judon, especially toward the end of the year. I think Barmore dealt with something physically at the very, very end of the season. But to me, he was more impactful late in the season in a lot of games as compared to Judon. Duggar, I'm not so sure about. Duggar, I thought, would take a massive leap last year. In his second year, coming from a lower-level competition at Lenore Ryan, we know his story. I thought last year was the year you'd see a massive, massive jump from Duggar. And while he was fine, I think he's a good player, he didn't become Derwin James or a Pro Bowl caliber strong safety. I think right now he is at his best defending the run, and that's great. But I think to be the player that a lot of people thought he had the ability to be, he's going to have to be more impactful in coverage. So I'm fascinated to see how he works against tight ends this year. Running backs have to be able to do that stuff in today's NFL to be considered a great safety. And I think they could use it. You know, Adrian Phillips is another player who can give you a little bit of everything. I think right now he's probably a little bit better in coverage than Kyle Duggar is. But you're going to need that explosive playmaking do a little bit of everything type at some point if you want your defense to get itself to another level. Duggar's that guy, or he should be. We just we need to see it. That's my opinion on him. Barmore, I think we have seen it. I think we've seen that this guy is a special talent, and nothing that we've seen in training camp would move me off of that spot. I think it'll be better. To me, he looks a little bit bigger. I don't know if that is in an effort to be used more on first and second down. But again, as long as Lawrence Guy and Devon Godshaw can can do their thing on early downs, and maybe that remains to be seen, the run defense certainly is room for improvement based off where they were last year. No doubt about that. But even if Barmore is a pass rushing specialist from the interior, he can be hugely impactful. And I think he could still be your best defensive player, even if he's used in more of a niche role because what happens on that down is just so important. And what happens in the passing game is so important, even for a defensive tackle. If he can create havoc from the interior, the way we saw him do at times last year, just do it more consistently, man, I think he's going to be a special player. And so to me, he is their best defensive player. I'm, I'm actually comfortable saying that right now. Uh, I know Judon went to the Pro Bowl last year. I know what his numbers were. I think Barmore is their most talented guy and is going to be their best defensive player in 2022. All right, that'll do it. There's your mailbag roulette. There's your interview with Trey Nixon. Thanks so much to Trey Nixon. Thanks so much to Andrew Jamil. Check out that fan-controlled football league. My goodness, they have a fan-controlled football league podcast, by the way. NBCLX's fan-controlled football league podcast is called the People's Pregame. Check that out for more info on the fcf there's a ton there i think you guys are going to find that fascinating so make sure you digest everything that you heard in all of those interviews and come back ready for another next pets next week we of course will have a patriots talk podcast for you as well later this week keep following all our training camp coverage we appreciate you we love you we'll talk to you very soon